Uh, good morning. This is our first lecture uh, in a series of lectures on compressible flow. And so I'm going to do some review here. Uh, first of all, uh, for the most part, uh, we've been discussing flows in which the density has been held constant. Uh, for many flows, we can't make that assumption. And this arises for high speed, uh, in the high speed flows of gas where the Mach number is greater than about 0.3. It's not exactly 0.3, there, but this is the, the generally accepted range when we go into the compressible flow range. Now, you don't know what a Mach number is yet. A Mach number, the Mach number is equal to the velocity divided by A, which is A is the speed of sound. And we'll talk about more how to get the speed of sound. Um, in our study of fluid mechanics, we can typically combine the internal energy and the flow energy, which we'll talk about in just a second here, into one term, which is called the enthalpy. So the enthalpy is represented by this letter H. So we have the internal energy plus P over rho. P over rho is the flow energy, and I've written that up here. U is equal to the internal energy, and that's the energy uh, related to the molecular structure of a system and the degree of molecular activity. It is the microscopic energy. So you know how molecules have, um, they can vibrate, they can rotate, and they can translate. And each one of those modes has a certain amount of energy in it. And the total uh, energy associated with the trans, uh, translation, rotation, and vibration is what we call the internal energy. And for an ideal gas, and a lot of times we deal with ideal gases, the internal energy is related just to the temperature. Okay. Come over here. The other term, P over rho, pressure over density, is called the flow energy. It's also sometimes called the flow work, and it's the energy. It doesn't look like an energy. If you look at it, it doesn't have the units of energy, but it's the energy per unit mass needed to move the fluid and maintain the flow. Now, if we talk about the total energy of a flowing system, we'll call that E sub flowing, that consists of the the flow energy, which is different from the flowing energy, the flowing energy is the flow energy plus this other term E, where E is all other energy besides flow energy. Any other type of energy that could be there is, is uh, contained in E. Now, if the other, this term E consists of internal kinetic and potential energy, and most of the situ the uh, flows that de we deal with uh, consist of that. So we're saying no magnetic, no electrical, no other type of energy, nuclear energy, anything like that. We're just going to uh, restrict ourselves to internal kinetic and potential energy. Then the flowing energy can be represented as the flow energy plus the internal energy. We, uh, we have a V squared over 2 term. That's our kinetic energy. And again, that doesn't have the units of um, energy, but it's actually kinetic energy per unit mass. So if you work it out, it does. And then we have the potential energy. And then if we combine the flow energy into the, and the in, uh, internal energy, like we did at the beginning, into our enthalpy, we have the flowing energy consists of the enthalpy plus the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. If the kinetic energy and the potential energy are negligible, then the enthalpy will represent the total energy of the system. Now, for high-speed flows, is what you were talking about now, although we can usually neglect the potential energy, we cannot neglect the kinetic energy. We're going to uh, define a new term now called stagnation uh, enthalpy. There's a typo here. This should be uh, stagnation enthalpy right here. And the stagnation enthalpy will represent the total energy, not including the potential energy. So when we talk about the stagnation enthalpy, we're talking about the total energy, as long as we are clear that we're neglecting the potential energy. The stagnation enthalpy then can be defined 
as what we call the static enthalpy. We we uh, we uh, denote H as what we call the stag static enthalpy, so we can separate that from the stagnation. So we have the static enthalpy plus the kinetic energy terms. And note that these all these terms have the units of energy over mass. All right, now let's consider the flow through a duct, such as a nozzle, a diffuser, or any passage where there is no heat transfer, which means that it's adiabatic. And we'll assume there's no shaft work, no electrical work, or any other type of work. And we're going to assume that there's no change in potential energy. So I've drawn such a system here, the uh, duct. And inside this duct, we have a control volume. And coming in, we have our static enthalpy. We have a velocity 1 over here. And we have our stagnation. So the stagnation enthalpy would consist of the, the static enthalpy and the kinetic energy term. So it comes out, and then on the other side, uh, we have a new, well, possibly a new uh, static enthalpy, a new velocity. And then, of course, we have the total energy, which was H02. Now, because it's adiabatic and there was no shaft work or anything like that, then the uh, total energy is given by our stagnation terms. So if we say the energy in has to equal the energy out, well, H01, our stagnation enthalpy in, has to equal our stagnation enthalpy out. So H1 plus V1 squared over 2 equals H2 plus V2 squared over 2. But the stagnation enthalpy remained constant. The static enthalpy can change and the velocity can change, but the stagnation enthalpy, which represents the total enthalpy, does not change. If somehow we're able to bring that fluid to a stop adiabatically, then we get what's called, well, what we do is we start over here with H1 plus V1 squared over 2. If we bring it to a stop adiabatically, then the uh, new enthalpy would be H2. And because it's stopped, there is no kinetic energy term. And that would be H02. So um, let me talk about that a second. So thus, the uh, stagnation enthalpy represents the enthalpy of a fluid when it's brought to rest adiabatically. So you can think of it like that. The stagnation enthalpy is the uh, enthalpy of the fluid if we can somehow slow it down to a zero velocity adiabatically. Now, the stagnation enthalpy is a term that exists. It, we may not have any place in the system where the flow is actually at zero velocity, but we can always calculate a stagnation enthalpy. Now, in the stagnation process, internal energy and flow energy are increased, resulting in an increase in pressure and temperature. And the properties at the stagnation state are what we call our stagnation properties. So we could have a stagnation temperature, a stagnation density, and a stagnation pressure. And we'll, uh, we'll indicate those by a subscript zero. Now, if we could also bring the flow down to a zero velocity um, uh, reversibly as well as adiabatically, we, the stagnation state would then be called the iso isentropic stagnation state. OK? Now, if the fluid is an ideal gas with constant specific heat, and we know that uh, the specific heat varies with temperature, but over a, a, you know, a small range of temperatures, we could pick an average specific heat. So it's not unreasonable to go with a constant specific heat. If we do that, then the enthalpy of the flow can be written as CPT. And we can, then we get, OK, on the left-hand side, we have our stagnation enthalpy. And that would be CPT0, where T0 is our stagnation temperature, would be CPT plus V squared over 2. And then we can rearrange that, and we can solve for the stagnation temperature. So the stagnation temperature would be the actual temperature plus our V squared over 2CP term. T0 now would represent the temperature that an ideal gas would attain when brought to rest adiabatically. And our V squared over 2CP term 
represents the temperature rise, and we call that the, well, it's sometimes called the dynamic temperature. Uh, usually you just call it the temperature rise, but either term is acceptable. So let's see how that uh, works out in a practical situation. For a low speed flow, and that's what we usually deal with, that's usually what we deal with. Let's say a low speed flow, 60 miles an hour, let's pick that. And if you work that out, that works out to about 27 meters per second. So probably many of you have ridden down the road, you put your hand out the car while you're riding along and you, you know how you go like this and make your hand go up and down while you sort of like an airfoil and you can feel it. And if you turn your hand like this, you know your hand's get, kind of getting buffeted. Well, somewhere on your hand, the flow has to come to a zero velocity and some will go over somewhere over the top, but you have, you can essentially, if you kind of cuff it, you'll get a, a stagnation point in your hand. And you probably held your hand out there, and I'll bet you you didn't feel your hand getting hot. You know, you felt it probably, it might have even felt cooler. Well, let's look at the temperature rise at 60 miles an hour. Our beat squared over 2 CP, the temperature rise is only 0.36 Kelvin. So you wouldn't even be able to detect that. It's so small that you would never know it. So at low speed flows, the stagnation temperature is very close to the actual temperature. So that's why one of the reasons uh, for low speed flows, we can ignore, we can uh, disregard the kinetic energy term. Now let's go to aircraft speed. So I picked 300 miles an hour. This is faster than a small Cessna, it's not, uh, like a Cessna 150 goes about 100 miles an hour. And an airliner is probably going to go about 500 miles an hour in that range, but this is somewhere in the mid range, and that's about 134 meters per second. Well, if we calculate the uh, temperature rise for that, um, v squared over 2 cp is equal to 8.9 uh, degrees Kelvin. So the temperature does become noticeable when you get up to these speeds here to 300 miles per hour. And so like for an airliner that's going 500 miles an hour, because it goes with the square, the temperature rise is going to be significant. And so pilots uh, that are flying at those kind of speeds when they're calculating the performance of the aircraft, they do have to take into account the temperature rise. They'll measure, there's a probe on the aircraft where they measure the temperature, and they have to take into account the temperature rise because it does make a difference. Now let's take an aircraft uh, flying at a Mach number of three. Mach number of three at sea level, which is about 1,068 meters per second. So I had to specify sea level because remember the Mach number is equal to the uh, velocity divided by the speed of sound. And we're going to find out later that the speed of sound depends on the temperature. So if we're going to pick a velocity uh, based on the Mach number, we have to specify the altitude. So the SL stands for sea level and that's about 1,068 meters per second. And I chose a Mach number of three because the SR-71 Blackbird, which was the fastest manned aircraft that's ever been built and flown operationally uh, could fly at about a Mach number of three. I think uh, on their very fastest flight they might have gotten up to a Mach number of 3.5. But let's, uh, th they cruised at pretty high Mach numbers. Let's see what the temperature on that would be. So, um, it's 567 degrees Kelvin which is 1,021 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature rise is over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that actually occurs on the aircraft. It doesn't occur everywhere on the aircraft, but anywhere the flow gets slowed down, and there are going to be places where it gets slowed down, especially in the intake to the engine, the temperature will go, will go way up. And it turns out this aircraft, um, the temperature did go up quite a bit, and so when the designers were designing it, they, uh, w you know, when the temperature of your materials change, the sizes change, the parts get longer or shorter depending on what the temperature is. And as the temperature changes, the parts don't fit as well. And one of the big problems they had on the, when they were designing this aircraft was um, fuel leaks because if you designed it so that everything sealed up nicely on the ground, when they got up to these high temperatures, then things didn't seal up. And so they thought, well, where do we want the, you know, where do we want the thing to seal up properly? They decided at the high Mach numbers, where he's going to be cruising in flight, will make everything work. Well, that meant on the ground, 
that things weren't going to work so well, and so they had a lot of problem with fuel leaks on the ground. So they had to design a brand new fuel to operate in this aircraft, and they came up with a much more viscous fuel so that it would not leak as fast. You know, the viscosity is the how easily it flows. So they made a more viscous fuel so that on the ground it would minimize the leaks. So this temperature rise is very real. It does happen. And then we take the another extreme case would be like when the space shuttle returned from orbit. Well, when the space shuttle came back, um, it would approach Mach numbers of up to 25. And at a Mach number of 25, if we calculated what the temperature rise would be, it would just be off the scale. Now, you know that the space shuttle was covered in heat-resistant tiles, but even those tiles would not um, withstand the kind of temperatures that you would get at a Mach number of 25. Now, what happens when you get up to those kind of speeds is the, uh, we no longer have an ideal gas anymore. What happens at those temperatures, as the temperature gets hotter and hotter, exceeding these temperatures right here, the molecules will start to dissociate. They will break apart. And when they break apart, they absorb energy. So it kind of limits the maximum temperature that they will see. But still, the temperatures on the space shuttle as it returns are extremely high, and that was the cause of some of the accidents, or at least one of the accidents that, that uh, they had with the space shuttle, where one of the tiles came off, the temperature in that point got really, really hot, it melted a hole through the wing, and then the entire internal part of the wing, everything was at stagnation temperature, and those stagnation temperatures were much hotter than what you see here, and it just caused the whole wing to burn off, and then the aircraft obviously went out of control, and uh, there was a catastrophe. Okay. Okay, in thermodynamics, you would have studied the Gibbs equations, where we have TDS equals DU plus PDV, and this V here represents the specific volume. It's not velocity, it's specific volume. And then we had TDS equals DH minus VDP. So if we look at the entropy change, I'm going to solve these two for entropy, DS. So we have this expression here, and then I'm going to write DU in terms of uh, CV. So DU is, could be written as CV DT. And then uh, P over T, if we assume an ideal gas, would be R over specific volume. And so we have this equation right here. And then for the other second of Gibbs equation, we have DS equals DH over T minus V over T DP. And I'm going to write DH as CP DT and V over T as R. Okay, now if the specific heats are constant, and we'll assume over a small range that they are constant. Then we can integrate and we can solve for the, uh, the entropy change. And we get this expression right here. I'm going to call the first equation star and the second equation double star. So let's come over here. Now, for an isentropic process, S2 minus S1 equals 0. So if, that's tr if we have an isentropic process, then we can write equation star as CV log of T2 over T1 equals minus R log of V2 over V1. We're going to introduce a new term here now called gamma. So it depends on which textbook you have. Some textbooks call it gamma, and that's what I'm going to call it. Some of them call it K, but either one is equal to CP over CV. So if we take this equation and we divide both sides per, by CP, we have this expression right here. Now I'm going to solve, uh, I'm going to do a little rearrangement here. We know that CP minus CV is equal to R, divide, uh, and you've learned that from thermo. This was from thermo. I've, I've added a new equation here. So I'll divide both sides by CP, and we get that, okay? Okay, continuing, we have R over CP then equals 1 minus 1 over gamma, and I can combine these to get gamma minus 1 over gamma. And then we also know that CV over CP then is 1 over gamma. So that if we go back to our um, original equation, we have 1 over gamma times the log of T2 over T1 equals 
gamma minus 1 over minus gamma times the log of V2 over V1. Now we'll use our rules of logarithms and we'll take the uh, coefficient here and we'll put it in the exponent. So we'll have the log of T2 over T1 to the 1 over gamma equals the log of V2 over V1 and I uh, raise to the gamma minus 1 over minus gamma. Now, most of the time in engineering, at least in mechanical engineering, we don't like, it's, it's kind of hard to work with specific volume. We think more in terms of density. So we're going to switch to density. So V2, our specific volume, you know, is equal to 1 over density 2, and then V1 is equal to 1 over density 1. And so if we plug that into our equation, we end up with T2 over T1 to the 1 over gamma. Or so we're going to raise everything, we're going to E everything up so we can get rid of the uh, logarithm. So we have T2 over T1 to the 1 over gamma equals rho 2 over rho 1 to the 1 minus gamma over gamma. And then because we have a 2 on the top here and a 2 on the bottom here, let's flip these over and we're going to pick up a negative. So I'll just reverse the order here. So we have T2 over T1 to the 1 over gamma equals rho 2 over rho 1 to the gamma minus 1 over gamma. And then let's raise both sides to the gamma power so we can at least get one, rid of one of the exponents. And we come over here and we get what's called our first isentropic relation. This is what I'll be referring to them as. It's a, it's a term that we'll be using a lot, or these, these equations we'll be using a lot. So our first isentropic relation is T2 over T1 equals rho 2 over rho 1 to the gamma minus 1. And because these are arbitrary points in the flow, we can choose any point we want. So we could, we could drop the T2 and T1. We could say, we could call, say, T2 is stagnation, and T1 is any other point. And we could write T0 over T is equal to rho 0 over rho to the gamma minus 1. And then we can follow a similar process using the equation of state to solve for other terms. So we could have P0 over P equals T0 over T to the gamma over gamma minus 1. And we have rho 0 over rho is equal to T0 over T to the 1 over gamma minus 1. And again, these three equations here I will be referring to as our isentropic relations. And we'll use these quite a bit. These three equations here, we'll use them quite a bit in solving for um, our problems. And that's all I have for this particular lecture.